Great. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we have a special guest. We have Dr. Amit Sharma, group lead at the SENS Foundation in uh, Senescence Immunology Research. Today, he's going to be covering his recent publication in Aging titled Enhanced Co-Culture and Enrichment of Human Natural Killer Cells for the Selective Clearance of Senescent Cells. Um, Dr. Sharma, why don't you start by giving a brief bio to the audience about your background, who you are. Thank you, Brian. Um, I started working as a group lead at Science Research Foundation about two years ago. Before that, I was doing a, uh, my postdoc at the Buck Institute um, in a project uh, in collaboration with Dr. Judy Kimpisi and Dr. Pankaj Kapahi. And we were looking at how uh, DNA damage response uh, can play an important role in uh, aging in age-related diseases, and that's how we got to do cellular senescence. Uh, I did my PhD back in India, and my PhD was in understanding allergic area of inflammation and how microRNAs are important in regulating that. Um, so this basically um, uh, project that I'm doing here at Sense and my lab, essentially, um, I bring both of my experiences together. Uh, by understanding a cellular senescence and how uh, innate immune system uh, plays a vital role in regulating it. Great. Um, maybe you could give us a little bit of background before your presentation begins about just the idea of using natural killer cells uh, for anything, really, to, to you control it as a biotechnology. Can you give us a little bit of background of like what's been done and what the idea is about around that? Natural killer cells, as the name suggests, are a type of innate immune cells which can recognize specific type of receptors uh, on the surface of any target. They play a very important role in, in regulating um, uh, cells that are infected with viruses or uh, uh, precancer cells or even cancer cells in our body and have been extensively studied and used uh, for cancer immunotherapy. Uh, technology has gone leaps and bounds um, in that direction. So they've shown that actually uh, adoptive transfer of NK cells to, to patients um, seem to have a very beneficial effect in, in, in regressing tumors, um, various kinds of tumors. And lately uh, they've found that um, uh, adaptation of CAR-T technology uh, where uh, we, can, uh, we can express um, a TCR, uh, to recognize a specific antigen on a cancer cell could be used to target them. And, um, and NK cells allow us to, to, to expand that technology even more, where uh, you, you, know, you could essentially take an off-the-shelf NK cell, modify it, um, and then use it essentially for many, many patients. So, yeah, and it has none of the side effects of CAR-T technology. So, yeah, I mean, these are pretty exciting cells. And uh, I got specifically interested in uh, NK cells since the original observation that they play an actual very important role in regulating senescent cells in our body as well. There's plenty of uh, evidence in that direction. And I'm trying to understand how, for how like innate immune cells like NK cells are regulating senescent cells, what are the factors that regulate that interplay and how we can utilize them to, to develop novel therapeutic interventions. Awesome. All right, well, with that introduction, why don't I let, let you kind of walk us through your paper and then we'll do a little Q&A afterwards. Sounds good to me, thank you. Let me start. Right, thank you. Again, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research um, in uh, general and uh, the kind of work uh, that my lab is doing and, and specifically the project uh, that we published recently um, in, in the journal Aging. So my lab, as I said, is focusing on understanding and engineering innate immune system in regulating senescent cells uh, as a therapeutic intervention. Um, as you know, uh, for the uninitiated, aging is an increasing uh, risk factor for many diseases. That information uh, has been out there and, and I, I don't think there is much debate 
on that. And we know that at least in developed countries, um, there is an increase in the number of people who would be over the age of 70. There is uh, some data right there in the United States. Uh, by 2023, one out of seven individuals will be over the age of 70. Um, and this is not only in the US, even in Europe, we see that there is an increase um, in individuals over, over the age of 70. And as we increase, there is increased incidences of cardiovascular disease, dementia, um, and cancer. So understanding how um, aging um, is, is regulating these processes could be very important in developing novel therapeutic interventions. Um, so my lab is at Sense Research Foundation and we consider aging um, interventions. Uh, basically, there are seven major forms of damages that occur and, and those could be, to, could be repaired um, to, to possibly extend uh, lifespan and, and improve health span. And my lab focuses on targeted ablation of death resistant cells uh, that we call senescent cells. Again, for the uninitiated, what are senescent cells? Um, so cells undergoing uh, any kind of damage, internal or external, can lead to a cell cycle arrest. Um, this arrest could be useful in, in tissue repair. Uh, you know, we know that um, uh, for repair of, uh, you know, after an injury um, and during embryonic development, this process is important um, and, and, and is vital. And most of those cells undergo apoptosis and they, they get cleared off and, and we do much better after that. However, some cells, for, uh, for certain reasons do not get cleared off. And we'll get into some of those reasons later on. And we start seeing an increased senescence burden. These cells uh, or long-term senescent cells tend to produce pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, metalloproteases, uh, also called SASP, which is known has, and has been shown to contribute to systemic uh, inflammation uh, as we experience um, uh, in aging and also called inflammation. So my lab mainly focuses on understanding why do we have increased uh, senescence burden with age. Um, and uh, we tend to solve, uh, to, to consider these to be the main problems, which is immune senescence, meaning the decline in immune surveillance that happens with age um, and propagation of senescence. Uh, as uh, the idea is that as we have more senescent cells in our body, they tend to produce more SASP, which can propagate a senescence um, uh, and, 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 and those two factors contribute to, to aging and accumulation of senescent cells. So uh, this brings us to the paper that, that we recently published here in Aging. And um, to get you a, a brief overview of what we have known about how NK cells and senescent cells interact. Um, NK cells are known to be one of the main drivers of immune surveillance of senescent cells. Um, that has been shown uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, briefly, natural killer cells express various kinds of um, uh, receptors on the surface that recognize stress ligands on the targets, uh, like MIG-A. Um, so once um, they recognize this receptor, they, they tend to scan the surface of the cell, in this case, senescent cells, and they find that um, depending on the density of the activating receptor or inhibiting receptors like HLA-E, um, NKG2D or NKG2A um, are engaged. And if there are more uh, MIG-A receptors or activating um, uh, ligands on the target cell, then natural killer cell releases these, uh, pro, uh, these perforins and granzymes that can create uh, pores in the target cell and cause apoptosis and, and they are eliminated. However, uh, it has also been shown that senescent cells uh, find a way to escape this immune surveillance by increasing the expression of HLA-E, which binds to inhibiting receptor and block the release of these perforins and granzymes. In addition to that, senescent cells release these pro-inflammatory uh, factors. Some of them are chemotractants for NK cells, but some of these factors include these soluble receptors, like uh, the, the extracellular uh, domain of MIK is cleaved off by metalloproteases, which can go and bind to these activating receptors, blocking them, blinding them. So these NK cells cannot recognize the targets. And again, another way by which uh, senescent cells can um, escape human surveillance. So we 
So better understanding of this, this process will allow us to develop novel um, therapeutic interventions. One of the things I'm not gonna get into right now, uh, we and others are trying to identify novel xenoantigens uh, that can, this information then can be used to engineer cars on NK cells to enhance the clearance of, uh, of these cells and avoid the, uh, this, this process, which is also subject to age um, so we can overcome that. But in any case, understanding this interaction and uh, the most optimal conditions by which NK cells can identify senescent cells uh, and remove them is, is going to be vital for any future therapeutic intervention. So we started by um, uh, establishing senescence model. This has been well established, well characterized by, by several other groups. Um, senescent cells uh, show various markers. Um, and not one marker is sufficient to characterize senescence. So we, we and others uh, test our cells by treating them, by, by establishing various uh, markers uh, to make sure our cells are truly senescent. So these are, uh, for instance, um, human uh, lung, uh, fetal lung fibroblasts that were treated with doxorubicin, pretty established model. And 10 days after doxorubicin treatment, we measure uh, the proportion of cells that express um, uh, senescence-associated beta-galactosidase activity and we find uh, a, a significant increase in the proportion of cells that express that. We also confirm the expression of cell cycle uh, checkpoint markers like P16 and P21, which seems to be significantly elevated in these cells and uh, confirm that by looking at the expression of lemon B1, which indicates the loss of nuclear lemina um, and uh, persistent DNA damage foci measured by gamma H2AX and uh, the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, IL-8, and IL-1 alpha was also elevated in these cells. Um, recently, uh, several papers uh, have shown that actually senescent cells are quite different and they are affected by the type of uh, damage. Uh, so we, we also, in, in this case, in order to study the interaction of NK cells with senescent cells, we also induce different kinds of damage. Um, and here you're showing that uh, we were able to induce senescence phenotype by radiating the cells with ionizing radiation uh, with x-rays or, treat, or treating these cells with etoposide. In either case, we've seen an in increase in uh, proportion of cells that increase, uh, which show an increase in uh, um, S-beta-gal uh, activity. In addition to that, we also measured the expression of um, main chemokines, uh, CCL5, CXCL9, CCL, uh, CXCL11, which are also the main chemotractants of NK cells. And we, we found that uh, senescent cells tend to produce very high levels of these chemokines. Now, briefly, NK cells are not necessarily a monolith. And at least in humans, they can be characterized by the expression of three, at least three um, markers, CD56, CD16, and CD3. Um, absence of CD3 is essential uh, because um, that way we can distinguish NK cells from T cells. So uh, these uh, cells which do not express CD3 um, and, and uh, express high levels of CD56 or, call, or, or we call them CD56 bride and do not express CD16 are not responsible for cytotoxic function or ADCC function, but they tend to release IF and gamma. Uh, many consider these to be an early stage uh, in differentiation of um, NK cells. Um, and uh, the other population of NK cells that, that we, are, we uh, frequently observe in peripheral circulation is CD56 uh, dim NK cells that also express CD16, but they're also CD3 negative. These are the ones which are mainly responsible for cytotoxicity and ADCC, but they do not produce cytokine. But there is an interplay between these two cell types because the F and gamma produced by the CD56 bright NK cells tend to affect the cytotoxic function of CD56 dim NK cells. So we uh, looked at the published literature and um, uh, figured that the best way to study the interaction of NK cells with senescent cells was to first isolate NK cells, purify them, um, and understand that we are working with a pure, purer population of NK cells. So we used um, Rosette antibody cocktail, um, which precipitates all immune cells in PBMC except NK cells, which are present in the, uh, in the interface uh, when we perform uh, um, a density gradient centrifugation. 
uh, and when drone with IL-2 uh, at 100 IU per ml, we were able to expand and activate NK cells. Here, as an example here, we're showing that um, when we look at uh, CD, NK cells in PBMC based on CD56 and CD16 expression, we, see, we are able to identify both these subpopulations um, of NK cells, which after three days in culture after isolation, we were able to expand them um, even more. Um, both the both the subpopulations. Uh, using this protocol, we were able to show an expansion of both the population of uh, CD56 dim, uh, CD16 positive, and CD56 bright and CD16 negative NK cells from different individuals, um, both which were males and female from the age of 20 to the age of 42. And and we saw that uh, we using this protocol, we can I could could um, isolate and enrich both these populations. Now, when we is set up our co-culture um, and we, we tried to keep the target to factor ratio uh, pretty consistent, pretty physiological. Now, NK cells are known to be very, very effective in killing their targets as long as the targets are affecting, uh, expressing the receptors, um, the activating receptors on the surface. And uh, a single NK cell, uh, it has been shown, is capable of killing up to, up to five targets. So all previous studies that have shown that NK cells can recognize and eliminate uh, senescent cells have often used very high um, effector uh, compared to targets, like very high numbers. So we wanted to keep it more physiological. So when, and we observed that when we keep one-to-one -one, uh, uh, target to effector, we were able to see significant killing of senescent cells. But as we increase the, uh, the, the factors, uh, NK cells in here, we saw that the Cytotoxicity towards senescent cells increased quite a bit, but we also saw non-specific killing increasing uh, with increasing number of uh, NK cells or proportion of uh, NK cells. And this was observed 16 hours after uh, co-culture of senescent IMR90 or non-senescent IMR90 with, with uh, primary NK cells. So we, we decided to stick to one-to-one -to -one target to factor ratio that because that by that, we were able to achieve significant killing, pretty, pretty modest, non-specific killing of non senescent cells. Um, and using this protocol, we were able to show pretty effective uh, killing of senescent IMR90, whether we use senescence by doxorubicin radiation or etoposide, as measured by the LDH uh, release assay. And again, we were able to show that using this protocol, we were able to achieve pretty effective killing um, whether once we isolated NK cells from different individuals, the, the, the cytotoxic uh, function was, uh, was, was preserved uh, uh, towards senescent cells, that is. Uh, there, is pretty, there is something interesting here that uh, we found that the male uh, NK cells were more effective in killing senescent cells, but I mean, the data set is too small and, and, and further analysis is required. Uh, most of these experiments, uh, that previously uh, have been done to show that NK cells can kill senescent cells were done with freshly isolated NK cells. And um, we were able to see cytotoxicity pretty, pretty, pretty well. Uh, but when we froze down these NK cells and revived them, and it has been shown that freezing of NK cells tend to reduce their cytotoxicity. Um, and this uh, and, and the and the ability of NK cells to kill senescent cells even after reviving um, is essential because if any uh, therapeutic intervention uh, has to occur, then we would most likely be working with uh, cells that has to be frozen down. And and we found that um, in our case, the the cells that we have isolated using our protocol seems to retain the cytotoxic function even after freezing. Um, this next set of experiments is pretty interesting because this really was essentially a mistake. So the student who was working on this project, um, uh, the first author in this paper, she one time forgot to, um, to remove the plate after uh, setting up the co-culture, after performing the assay. Um, and when, she, when we came back um, after the weekend, we, we looked at the plate, we observed that I, after four days in co-culture, most of the non-senescent cells were still fine but, senescent, but uh, these NK cells continue to kill uh, senescent cells. And we, and we were able to see pretty low numbers um, of, um, of surviving senescent cells in co-culture. And this was the case with uh, doxorubicin treated senescent cells radiate, uh, or, uh, or whether we use senescence by radiation or etoposide treatment, we continue to see a decline in the numbers of, of uh, senescent cells, whereas non-senescent cells tend to 
uh, tend to survive really well, even after four days in co-culture. And this was measured by calcium AM assay, where we were just measuring the, the surviving cells on the plate. And we chose to do this instead of, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the LDH release assay, because um, uh, LDH after release is not very necessarily very stable, and it has a half-life of uh, um, uh, 16 hours. Um, and it tends to degrade after that. So we decided to just count the number of cells that are still attached to the plate. Um, and here is the image of what we normally see after 16 hours of co-culture with uh, of senescent cells with NK cells. So whereas uh, non-senescent cells pretty uh, seem to survive really well, um, uh, the co-culture, uh, we tend to see um, that uh, after 16 hours of co-culture, uh, the num there are uh, only fewer uh, senescent cells surviving. Um, and if we allow this culture to go on longer, then we see almost all senescent cells are gone, which we think is pretty interesting. And we are following up on this. We're trying to understand the differences between uh, the senescent cells that are killed after 16 hours of co-culture versus the ones uh, that, that cannot survive um, after longer co-culture. So we're trying to understand the difference of uh, difference between these two cells, that probably will form uh, another way we can target these cells. With that, uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge my team who participated in this work. Um, uh, uh, Tess is the postdoc who contributed significantly in the study. Uh, Christy is the first author. Uh, Yafe has just joined our lab. He didn't really participate in this work. Um, Gina also initially helped us uh, with this project. Um, Ashley is a master student who's uh, pursuing uh, another way by which we are identifying surface receptors. She didn't participate in this project, but she uh, has been pretty helpful. Uh, with that, I'll uh, thank you um, and uh, aging for allowing me to talk about my research here. And I'll take any questions. Great, unfortunately, you're only stuck with my questions, um, but thanks for the presentation. Um, first, I might have missed it, but can you kind of walk generally high level uh, kind of what is the procedure um, on isolating or enriching for the NK cells? Right, so um, we use a cocktail of antibodies um, which is designed to precipitate cross-link with RBC and precipitate um, all cells except NK cells in the co-culture. So when we perform um, uh, a density gradient centrifugation uh, with PPMC, uh, you know, we, we can use histopac, overlay the blood, and we, we spin it down, we can get PPMC. But if we pre-incubate the blood with this cocktail of antibodies, uh, everything will precipitate. And the only thing that, that would be in the interface would be NK cells. So these NK cells are pretty pure, um, uh, quite enriched. They are uh, very high proportion of CD56 expressing cells. If we just look at that, uh, they're CD56 positive, they're CD16 um, um, uh, low, or, uh, or, 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 or um, uh, I mean, they, they are CD66 positive and they don't have CD3 expression. So we've, we've seen by, by simply doing this initial isolation step, we remove all, all contaminating cells. Um, the previous some papers have shown that actually NK cells are pretty good in removing senescent cells, uh, but they have either worked with, um, with the NK cell line or they worked with uh, PPMCs. And PPMCs tend to contain um, um, uh, CDA T cells and, uh, and CDA T cells can attack um, other cells as well, like non senescent cells as well. So they tend to have a, a higher cytotoxicity towards non senescent cells. So they end up doing a very shorter uh, co culture which again is not necessarily very physiological. Gotcha. And, and part of my ignorance, but I'm just trying to think in, in practice, if this ever reaches the clinic, right, which cer certainly seems very promising, is there, do we need to like do HLA matching like we would do for bone marrow or is this kind of like you can farm a whole bunch of NK cells for people and use it just indiscriminately? There are, there are three, three possible avenues this can go in. One that we are also exploring uh, is to get uh, fetal NK cells and, and use them as off-the-shelf NK cells and, and, and relatively in patients who are having like a disease phenotype, which is, con which is uh, affected by senescence burden. Those cells could be very effective 
um, in removing those. We could also talk about isolating NK cells from uh, blood relatives and then doing an adoptive transfer to show that uh, to, to remove senescent cells. Um, and, and, and another thing that can be done is that we can haplomatch NK cells and make a blood bank, um, I mean, a bank of NK cells, which can, which can basically cover the entire human population. And then we could partially match them and then do a transplantation that way. Got it. Um, sticking on the whole theme of, uh, of how this might play out uh, clinically in the future, um, on the issue of target to effector ratio. I know you, you try to keep it one-to-one -one in your case, but I could also imagine if you're, if you're in, in a situation of a child, let's say, where there might not be that many senescent cells, it might be good to keep a low ratio. But if you are in a isolated situation, let's say uh, for like osteoarthritis or something where, you know, you, you might want uh, more bang for your buck. <laughs> Do you think that you would then want to tune that uh, target to effect a ratio to be a little bit more, I guess, efficient and more aggressive, I guess. Yeah, that, that, that is true. And, and also, I think we can also design NK cells to recognize unique antigens on the surface of cells. There are several groups who are made like significant progress in this, and we are also working on this, that we can actually design these NK cells to express cars towards a target. So that way we can still limit the, the target effect ratio, and then we can we can get very uh, high effective killing. Yeah. And so your, your question actually made me think of another question uh, around senescent cells. Are senescent cells all the same or are there actually different flavors of senescence? It's been shown that there is different flavor of senescent cells. So depending on the cell of origin um, and the type of um, uh, uh, you know, insult that is causing senescence, uh, they 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 actually have a profile quite different. Uh, another thing that we uh, are looking into is that uh, primary senescent cells and paracrine senescent cells are also different uh, in terms of gene expression. Uh, we've also observed it. We are looking to publish that pretty soon. Um, and also, uh, the it has been shown that within a population of senescent cells, at least in vitro, we know that uh, by performing single cell analyses, they are quite different. Um, so yeah, there is significant variability on these cells. But what we know is that almost 90% of senescent cells express um, one or the other uh, stress marker like, uh, like Mike on the surface. Um, so, so it is still possible for NK cells to recognize them all and, and, and kill them. Gotcha. Another uh, ignorant question for me around senescent cells, but you at the earlier slide, you, you describe all the different uh, uh, defenses that a senescent cell has to block NK cells. Yeah. What's, what's the reason behind having those in, in your thinking? Uh, it seems like it, it definitely, evolutionarily, uh, a cell probably wants to preserve itself, but from the standpoint of an organism, that might not make sense. But am I thinking about that incorrectly? No, oh, you're absolutely correct. And that is a good question. And we, we are also looking into that. So. I think partly uh, the expression of um, inhibitory receptors on the surface like HLA-E could be a way by which a cell is actually um, calibrating the immune surveillance function by NK cells, meaning it probably is, uh, is a, that gives us it, uh, the, that cell more time to repair whatever damage it has. Um, and, and, and so it's not eliminated like prematurely just by expression of stress receptors on the surface. Um, the release of these soluble proteins um, uh, or, or these surface receptors like Mike or soluble Mike to block NK cell function possibly could be a byproduct of a modified matrix of senescent cells, where there are several proteolytic enzymes that are just active on the surface and they just cut off um, uh, these uh, surface proteins and release them. Um, so it could be it could be both of those things. It could be a way by which cell has evolved ways to just prevent itself from dying, uh, and other could just be a byproduct of inflammation. Right, certainly would make sense that uh, the latter could make sense, and that like biology maybe hasn't thought that far ahead, and this is just yeah. it, this is just the way it is. It doesn't have to make sense necessarily. Exactly. And we also know that the ability of NK cells to function appropriately also declines with age. We quite don't understand why that is. And we're looking into that as well. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, that also happens. I mean, uh, that the, the ability of our immune system also declines. So in addition to the fact that senescence are mounting these ways to prevent uh, clearance, the immune, the immune system also is not as effective as BH. Gotcha. So that's why uh, you alluded to fetal sources of NK cells as potentially nice uh, to have, which makes me think we're, we're now we're having the heterochronic parabiosis folks meeting the NK cell based therapy folks. Um, yeah, that's yeah. nice. Um, so big picture, where are we in the development uh, of NK cell based therapies for senescence right now? Do we, ha, are there in, have there been in, in vivo studies at all? Um, do we know the tolerance of an in vivo organism to such a therapy? Uh, we are starting it. Um, I mean, there is so much information from cancer that we can learn that will be useful for us uh, when we're talking about any NK cell based therapy. Um, they have done adoptive transfer in mice. They're pretty effective. They're pretty well tolerated in patients as well, at least in context of cancer. Um, so what we are doing is right now we are isolating NK cells. We've done that from young and old mice. And we are trying to see if, if there is an age-related decline in immune function of NK cells that may be contributing, especially when we isolate these splenic NK cells, enrich them in vitro, and then try to transplant them back in, in, in uh, old mice or uh, doc service treated mouse models to see how that affects an SS burden. That I think would be the basis of any further clinical work that, that goes in that direction. Makes sense. Um, last question to you, bigger picture of what are some bottlenecks? Every time uh, you know I'm involved in research, there's always some one piece of knowledge or funding, you know what to do, but you just don't have the funding or maybe the technology is limited. What do you think are the biggest bottlenecks in driving this technology forward? I still think that we do not completely understand the surface of senescent cells um, and, and, and how heterogeneous these cells are. Um, so that's what we're trying to focus on. And, and that's where really the bottleneck is moving forward. Um, and, and there is a case to be made that they are so different, these cells, senescent cells, depending on those various factors we discussed, that they may not, it is possible that we may not have like one way to target them. There, there may be um, such variation in these cell types that we may have to think of multiple ways to, to look into these cell types. The other bottleneck is uh, getting clinical sample. I think most of the work so far, uh, and we are kind of guilty of that as well, is being done with cells which are grown in culture, adapted to grown in culture. And I think more work has to be done on primary tissue, which is not that easy to come by. Yep. Unless you're doing it in a mice, I suppose. <laughs> well, mice, the interesting thing about mice is um, NK cells in mice and humans are very, very different. And they express very different receptors. So we'll have to very seriously think about how to go about that. I mean, that's why I talked about like how we could maybe use primary human tissue. I'm very interested in um, looking at these, uh, you know, organ on chip models as an alternative to mouse models as well. Got it, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm happy to donate all of my senescence uh, cells and tissues to you uh, for your research, so. I, I appreciate that. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you for walking us through this very exciting paper. Um, best of luck to you and your lab and the whole field for driving this forward. It seems like very exciting. Um, I hope that uh, it comes to fruition within my lifetime so we could all benefit from it. Thank you so much uh, for talking to me about this and talking, uh, giving me a chance to explain my research a little bit more. Um, and thank you uh, to the General Aging for actually allowing us to publish this was my first corresponding author paper. So I'm, I'm very glad that I was given this chance. This will open up a lot of doors for me. Thank you.